All right. Well, welcome to our very first uh, office hour virtual. Um, I'm excited to be here with you today and uh, welcoming uh, um, uh, many of you. Um, some of you will be joining us uh, live from wherever you may be. Many of you are, are here in Madison. And uh, we are working out how this all works together. And the first thing I'm noticing is that I need to mute what's going on in my headphones because I can hear myself giving feedback on YouTube. Give me just a moment. Perfect. Uh, so looking forward to having this conversation with you today. Um, I wanted to begin by uh, saying that this is a part of the way that we could do this today, part of um, the uh, co-sponsorship of this event is Holding History, um, and uh, Holding History is is a is a program uh, here at the University of Wisconsin at Madison uh, that has been doing uh, interactive uh, book having interactive bookish conversations uh, for about five years over the course of the time that we've been working. We've had about twenty five hundred people do some sort of interactive um, event with us, whether it's looking at old books uh, or uh, making paper or uh, using a printing press or a number of other things like that. We're in a new world right now and we can't have as many interactive events. So we're, we've been moving to a more digital uh, um, mindset uh, to keep some of our programming going during during this time. And this is one of our first steps uh, holding history. Uh, co-director uh, Sarah Marty and, 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 and I'm also a co-director uh, with Sarah Marty. Uh, we are excited to bring you uh, these office hour events. We're gonna bring a few more of them to you uh, this semester in conjunction with a class that I'm teaching at, at, here at the University of Madison called Why Shakespeare? It's a course that is a large lecture course. We tend to have mostly non-English majors and many of many of uh, you students who are, who are watching today, you're here with us. And uh, for some reason you, you want to know what, what's, what, what's, what's the deal with this one guy who gets the whole course at UMass and what's going on there and how do we better understand him? And is that justified? It's questions we'll be asking. So uh, today, our first guest, it's an incredible honor for our first virtual office hour guest. Um, it's an honor to welcome Sarah Day. Sarah is probably best known as one of the core company actors for American Players Theater. Uh, the American Players Theater in Spring Green, Wisconsin, many of you have been to. It's a professional theater situated on 110 acres of woods and meadows just down the road in Spring Green, uh, with annual attendance over 100,000 and an annual budget in excess of 6 million. APT ranks as the country's second largest outdoor theater devoted to the classics. Now, it's been, much like it's been an odd year for us at Holding History, it's been an odd year for APT, and they've still been making some great programming, uh, digital programming as well. So if you haven't had a chance to check that out, you might. We're all looking forward to when we can go back up the hill and, and, and watch Sarah Day perform on the stage uh, there. The APT was founded in 1979. Uh, Sarah Day has been there with APT since 1986, entrancing audiences there. Sarah's a Wisconsin native, a graduate of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She began her theatrical career at Wilson Street, Wilson Street East Dinner Playhouse, we may hear more about that, while pursuing her BA in history at UW-Madison. Sarah is also instrumental now in, uh, in helping to found and to continue to perform in Forward Theater Company's uh, uh, productions. And she's a member of the Forward Theater Advisory Committee. Uh, in 2018, last thing, I, I mean, I could go on and on about Sarah Day here, but the last thing I want to tell you about Sarah, 2018, she was named a fellow of the Wisconsin Academy of Sciences and Art, Arts and Lectures, an honor that recognizes accomplished individuals with a lifelong commitment to intellectual discourse and public service. And let me just say that uh, the her, her willingness to to uh, keep coming on the on this uh, this show with me, this office hour show is, is one example of how, how devoted she is to the community and to education. So without further ado, uh, let me welcome Sarah Day to the show. Good morning. Sarah Day, good morning. Thanks for joining our show. Uh, we are excited to have you here. We have so many things to talk about. Um, <laughs> I'm, I want to warn you, I have, we have done this. How many times have we done this? We've done, it's been a few. Uh, at least maybe four, three or four. Yeah, I would say at least. Um, and, and every time we run out of time and <laughs> every time we get really good questions from students and, and yeah. I don't know what's going on. We have a special group of students today. Uh, I have over 80 questions for you. Or any, I, there's there's no way I'll get through them all. And not only are they just quite, they're good questions. So I hope you are ready uh, to take some questions here today. Uh, I am. Because it's, it's, 
it's an exciting day. So um, I am just uh, going to make sure I've got my my correct notes here, and then we'll dive in. Um, I guess my first question, and this was what the first thing. Well, I'll tell you, we did. We're, we're in this new digital world, and uh, there's a lot of quite, people can upvote the questions. Right? So we could see what people want to hear answers to. We had two. I'm going to start with our two most upvoted questions. So the first one um, comes from Katie, and Katie asks, "Oh, here's a, we're starting off with a, a sort of a million dollar question here. You ready? Why do you believe performing Shakespeare in our current society is important? And what does it teach new generations?" Oh, 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 okay. Um, <laughs> so just a little, little, little small question, you know, just, you know, warm you up. I, I am a great believer in the fact that Shakespeare is uh, one of the greatest writers in the English language, that he helped create so much new language. And I think as a base core of sort of um, understanding English, I think he's an incredible way to start. I think one of the great things too for me as an actor is that I don't believe only reading him is sufficient. I think he um, made it clear that these were plays that were meant to be heard primarily and then also to be seen, that these stories are meant to be shared within a community as opposed to being read alone, though I do think that that is a second, um, a good thing to do secondarily. I think he's a good core for a lot of people, but he's just the beginning. I don't think he is the be all and the end all, but I think that he gives us a real rich understanding of uh, the quality of being human. Um, I think he has understandings that um, many psychologists sort of come to later on. I think um, there are many plays that feel so intensely of the moment um, either in a personal or in a political life. And I think his insights um, never fail to amaze me. Um, I don't believe he's the be all in the end all though, but I think he is a great start for a lot of great literature. I, I love that answer because it leads right into our second most upvoted question, which is then, you know, who is your, this is from Eric, who's your favorite playwright other than Shakespeare? Who else does these kinds of things really well? Um, I, I, I'm not only trying to be with old white men, but another one that is really intriguing to me um, is uh, George Bernard Shaw, mm -hmm. who when I was younger, I really uh, had a lot of difficulties with because I think when I was younger, um, I was looking for answers and Shaw would never give you answers. He gave you arguments. And like any great lawyer or any great philosopher, he was giving you an argument and then you figure it out from there. And the challenge that he presents is always um, is so frustrating and ultimately a very rewarding experience. He can be read though, and his stage directions alone are worth reading. Um, but he's always an incredible challenge to me that I find exciting. I wanna take that in two directions. Um, We've been talking about stage directions and how hard it is to know, right? Just like reading a, a text message where you don't quite know what the tone is supposed to be. When you don't have all these stage directions in Shakespeare, how do you know how to read it? And you're right. Some some other playwrights give you a lot more. They tell you a lot more about how the characters are interacting. Um, and and, and I, 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 yeah. Shaw will have a line, her pupils dilate. And you want to go... <laughs> Okay, well, that's pretty specific. I don't know that I can act that sufficiently <laughs> to see me even more than, you know, four feet away. But um, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I just believe that answer. I believe you can make your pupils dilate on command. I, I've seen you. I, 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 I want to also bring in uh, another, just a really modern playwright who has who has been here on Office Hour with us before um, that, that I know you also enjoy, uh, Lauren Gunderson. Uh, you and I, we got to go see the Book of Will together with co-director uh, of Holding History of Sarah Marty. And and then, uh, then we got to see you act in it. And and uh, um, I wonder if you, you, you um, 
Is, is the Book of Will your favorite play by Lauren Gunderson or is there a different one? It's right up there. And part of it is because it is intensely personal for me. Um, uh, seeing it with you and Sarah was a real, uh, was such a treat for me. But when I first read that play, which is about um, Shakespeare's uh, company uh, putting together the folio, um, well, American Players Theater was founded by Randall Duke Kim Anne Oak, and Anne Okio Grosso and Charles Bright. And they used the folio as the script because it was created by the players of Shakespeare's company, hence American Players Theater. And the idea that a group of actors putting this together, as opposed to, please don't be offended, Professor Calhoun, but not academics, but rather his group of players that had played these roles, had shared the stage with Shakespeare, putting that together. And, um, and American Players Theater then doing it with our company of players. It was just like, this is so personal and what I had been dedicating the last 30 some years to my life was a company of players putting on these plays. And um, so it, it just, every moment of it resounded with me in reading this play. I thought it was told with a sense of humor and of theatricality and of intimacy and wonderful relationships, wonderful female characters. And when Brenda DeVita, the artistic director of APT told me that we were going to be doing that play, I just said, I, 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 I am begging you. I am begging you for a role in it. I will play somebody in the, uh, in the, in, in the print shop. I just want to be in it. I love this play so much. And she, she, we were having lunch and she just, I've never, you've never asked to play something. I go, and, and I will do anything, literally sweep the floor. And she's like, I, I, I'll talk to the director and I'll see what he thinks. And then to be able to somehow play, I was able to play Anne Hathaway, the widow of uh, William Shakespeare was like, oh, it was, yeah. So yes, I do love that play. And I think she's, she is a great lover of Shakespeare and it felt like a real love letter to the actors and, um, and to Shakespeare. So I'm, I like that. I like Silent Sky and I liked, um, I and you, um, yeah, I'm I'm a I'm a fan of Lauren Gunderson. Yeah, I, I am too. <laughs> I, 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 uh, she's wonderful. I, I so uh, well. I, I should. Um, I've already trailed off into my questions, uh, and I should keep going with. Uh, we won't get through them all, but I want to acknowledge so many people who asked questions. So, um, you know, this is before we move on. There, there was a sort of section. I I, I end up putting these questions in sections. And I, I thought there was, there were a number of questions about Shakespeare's relevance. So Katie had already asked about, what does it teach new generations? Um, this is a slightly different one, maybe one more take on it. Adeline asks, what's the most important thing that college age kids, kids or, or young men or women can take away from theater or Shakespeare? Slightly different question, right? Theater or Shakespeare? Well, um, I have to say that I am missing theater right now um, in the sense that I believe the great thing about um, theater has to do with um, sh sharing a story in community as we're all gathered around watching real people tell these stories is I think something that is at the beginning of, you know, circles around a, you know, a, a fire, a bonfire, that you share stories together and act them out. And I think it is inherently a communal activity. Um, and that's something that I'm missing terrifically right now in this time of uh, self-isolation. Um, and I think that uh, our sharing of stories is what's important about theater for kids and for anybody. And um, Shakespeare is just such a, his lovely use of language, the sound of the language that he creates is something that I find um, incredibly important for anyone. I think that uh, so much of poetry needs to be an oral understanding of, of what language is as opposed to just a, a written word, a mass of, 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 of beautiful things on paper, which is lovely, but it's also um, the sounds and how it resonates within our body and is a more fully full body experience. 
So uh, maybe there's an encouragement here for, uh, for for us to start more reading groups, even while we're on Zoom and hear, hear this, these sounds out loud. Uh, yeah. And uh, I, I, so I've got some questions that I've, I've grouped a, a little bit about your book, because of course we're interested in, uh, you know, as uh, met, there may be others on, on YouTube watching who have already picked their career track, but many of those watching are at a, at a place in their life where they're sort of deciding, like, well, where am I gonna go with this and how do I, take these sort of disparate interests and make them into a, a, a fulfilling life. So mm -hmm. I, I note that um, Benjamin asks, you almost ended up in a career as a diplomat, something <laughs> that doesn't seem to have much in common with acting. What drew you towards politics? Um, I was raised in a, a political family. Um, my parents were both active uh, in party politics. And then, um, uh, so it was always, uh, a part of dinner table conversation that I was always, I was an only child of older parents. And so I was, I was a listener uh, at a dinner table of, of things that were part of a community um, and, and how uh, politics and government is able to make a difference in people's lives and have a positive impact on people's lives. And I think um, diplomacy uh, had to do with the fact that I liked languages and I enjoyed how it was sort of a childish kind of a thing in some ways. I love the idea of the glamour and the travel of it and of, and of working and, and learning about different cultures and different societies and how, um, how I may be able to affect other lives, have an impact. And I think in some ways um, that I, I don't think I realize that I think that theater can also um, have an impact on some people's lives. It's, it, um, I'm finding out how much people are missing it right now. And um, yeah, I think it's, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I suspect we have some in the, in the audience today who are, who are missing it. They're here today for it. So I'm excited to, um, yeah, to continue the conversation about theater, but I'm gonna ask you one more question about politics and theater, which is, um, uh, we have talked before about this question of, um, if you had to pick one uh, character from Shakespeare, mm -hmm. uh, if, if, if you had to elect one character from Shakespeare as, as, as president, yeah. who would it be? And I, 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 first time you told me, I was surprised by your answer, I love hearing it again. Who's, who, who's your pre president whom? President Theseus, um, I think. From Midsummer uh, Night's Dream, okay. From Midsummer, because, yeah. um, and I we've had a discussion about this before, but I think how he presents himself is as someone fairly weighing um, each side. He begins um, uh, being challenged by a father and daughter who are at odds, and he tries to weigh the scales of justice and create some justice within a situation. Mm -hmm. That um, that allows a young woman to actually be able to escape with her boyfriend, and I think he does that in a way to um, to be fair. And I think there's a fairness about him that I really um, enjoy. I think how he treats the um, mechanicals is a sign of um, of respect for everyone. That he wasn't he was the one not really making fun of them. He he was respecting um, the workmen the workers that came before him. And um, I think he was trying to woo someone as his wife who he had defeated in battle, but he wants to win her affection. And there's something um, that on a very private level, on a public level, he, tr he is doing his best to treat people fairly and with respect. You, I always enjoy hearing you answer this question. I ask it for the benefit of our audience, but also for my own benefit, because I, I'm aware once again of, of, of the difference that you pointed to be, at the beginning between reading and performing or seeing a play. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think what you said there, I don't think about it much. But, um, thank you for the insight. Uh, I was talking in, in, in class the other day about, uh, um, you know, the, the, the mechanicals performance being laughed at, being uh, sort of ridiculed. Mm -hmm. But you're right. I mean, as, as a reader, I'm thinking of a group the rulers and the lovers kind of laughing at this performance uh, mm -hmm. by people who are just trying to make a living, right? Um, <laughs> if you're acting the part of Theseus, you have to decide whether you're snickering over there or pointing or whether you're, you know, there, there's actually something you have to choose to do. 
And I think you're right. I think I, I haven't really thought about that uh, carefully enough. I will be thinking about it. We're, we're working through Midsummer Night's Dream now. But, uh, how, what the role of Theseus would look like, and what his reactions might be, and how they might really stand out from the others. Um, well, I mean, it is the lines, and I probably will misquote this, but never anything can be amiss if simpleness and duty tender it. Yeah, um, yeah. Is how he discusses yeah. them. You want to go? Oh, yeah. 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 I yeah. like that. I, I, you've, you've, you uh, will be finishing Midsummer Night's Dream as a class uh, next week, and so you've made me uh, excited to to review those lines. I've told students before that, that, that the thing that happens to me with almost every play uh, is that I, I, I reread it, you know, having read it dozens or hundreds of times, and I think that line could not have been there last time. Like I'm, <laughs> somebody added it, you know, and you just see something new. Um, I love that about literature and the thing too that has been exciting for me over my career, um, of particularly of doing Shakespeare, is to have different roles that I play within the same um, within the same play, and coming at something, you know, in my twenties, my thirties, my forties, my fifties, um, it all, it, um, my understanding of the world, um, a different perspective of a different character, gives me a different insight into something that you just that couldn't have been there. And I I think that that's about any great piece of literature that you read, that you come at it um, from a different, you come at it from a different point and are able to read, um, read and see and feel different things. You know, I was going to go to another bio question, but that what you just said there makes me want to ask a question that Sydney asks over here. She says, have you performed as Ophelia in Hamlet? If so, how difficult or not was it to perform such a complex character? And I want to um, see with, uh, with your, um, hopefully grace on this, I, I, I'm going to add to this question. Like, maybe it's Ophelia, maybe not, but it's that idea of playing as a younger uh, person, playing a younger person, and then looking back on that role now, um, how, how difficult, I mean, do you see complexities now that you wish you'd seen then or vice versa? Um, um, yes, I, I did play Ophelia and I had the great good fortune of playing it, I think the last time that Randall Duke Kim, the founder of it, had um, was performing the role of Hamlet. And he was in his 40s and I was in my 20s. And um, I, 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 loved, I loved playing that character. I, um, uh, th the other thing that was interesting about that, that season as Randy was saying that he was letting the character of Hamlet go and the next year he was beginning work on Lear is that he then had a younger actor who was literally my same age, two weeks older than uh, I am, um, also play the role of Hamlet for about eight performances. So at one point I'm playing Hamlet who is the founder of this theater, a man I respect so greatly, um, who was a prince out of my stars in every kind of a way. And playing Ophelia with Randy was an incredibly different experience than playing it with my friend, who's, you know, I'm god godmother of his daughter, um, where it's like, oh, it seems possible he could be my boyfriend. Um, I, so having that within the same, literally switch back and forth within a week, um, playing uh, that role with two very different Hamlets, but that role was so, she's really clearly written as someone who, you know, the three men in her life of loving her brother, of loving Hamlet, and of loving and wanting to be a good daughter. And so she's so torn by each of these three men who she believes want the best for them because she wants the best for each of them. She loves her brother. She, you know, um, it is you know, I think so much of her break had to do with the fact that she didn't know whom to trust. And you know, this young woman was not able to trust herself enough because she had invested a lifetime of trusting um, trusting each of these men. That's, that's where I am right now as I look back 30 some years later at it. But um, it's, I, 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 I loved playing her. Um, a little yeah. bit later, I was able to play Gertrude, unfortunately with the same Hamlet. So though he was two weeks older than me, I was now his mother, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> which 
was part of the, which was an interesting challenge in and of itself. But but playing Ophelia was, um, I, it's a an experience I I truly cherish. I again want to go two directions on this. I'll go with the first, which is that you, when you talk about Ophelia, it's really touching to me. Um, something we've been noticing as a class is that you know when I'm talking about Romeo and Juliet, or I've been noticing as I say teach and then hearing some feedback I'm talking about Romeo and Juliet, and, uh, you know both the plague that happens in London before Romeo and Juliet is staged and then the way that plague comes into Romeo and Juliet. And suddenly talking about plague feels very different, right? And to hear you talk about Ophelia right now, um, it, it, it's very moving because it, it, right, what I'm, what I'm hearing is that Ophelia, there's a sense of isolation that she's, Oh yeah. She just feels so distant and there's, there's just, she doesn't know how to connect with, with, with anyone in a really meaningful way. Right. Yeah. And uh, suddenly that's, that, that feels really relevant to the moment. Um, that, in, you're in the right. Moment. Because I mean, uh, Hamlet has, uh, has, has left and her brother is off to school and her father is dead. And those three main relationships. Yeah. She is, she is self isolating and uh, yeah. 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 And uh, I think of our many, our many students, uh, even even maybe in the audience today, you know, they're, they're, you know, this is a just a, um, a sentiment for you, a thought for you. You know, there's there, you know, some some are dealing with quarantine and feeling feel that isolation, and uh, yeah. do know that we are uh, we're we want to continue to talk to you and, and, and be in conversation with you. So, uh, but that mo that that conversation about isolation really hits me uh, uh, today. Um, I do want to also pick up on another point, though, which is. This idea that on, on, on one occasion you can be uh, Ophelia to Hamlet, and then uh, as a woman, suddenly you become the mother of Hamlet, in, in, yeah. and 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 this guy's still playing Hamlet. What's going on there? <laughs> well, I mean, several Why, years. Yeah. I mean, several years later, playing Gertrude. Um, yeah, it was. I think it was maybe five or six years later that I was then. Um, I, it was such, uh, it was such a lovely way to, uh, to understand the play in a different way. Um, and I think those are the wonderful parts of being an actor within these texts, um, is that, uh, the opportunity to, to then sort of be part of, uh, Claudius's world, um, because of of her love for him, uh, Gertrude's love for him, it just it makes you to be able to have the empathy to be able to play different characters and different and have a different understanding of the play is one of the things that's exciting about being in company and then sort of re uh, circulating these different uh, Shakespeare plays within a number of years um, is uh, is is a great challenge because you have a completely different perspective on everything and what the story is. And I, I love that. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop my own questions because I, I, we have so many good questions. I'm also gonna recognize that this is a new setting for me. I've never done this before uh, in quite this way, but I, I, I think that I'm able to, I could, I, for those of you over on YouTube, I can see the, the chat on the side. There's about a 15 second delay probably for you, but, um, should you have questions, even as Sarah's answering, I, um, we will try it. I'll see if I can, I can, I can also catch on to some of those questions and bring them in. If you want to grab onto something, Sarah said, just like I have been doing. Um, so let's go to some tips and tricks. Um, and uh, Eli asks, how do you usually, uh, what do you usually do to get into character? Do you have any favored recommended methods for interpreting Shakespeare's writing? So we're thinking get into character, but it sounds like this question is especially getting into a Shakespearean character. Um, every character has a different um, rhythm to it or a different, you have a different sensibility with each of your characters. And, you know, uh, I, I always need to, um, one of the things that I really <laughs> love is to really try and face the beginning of a play by being ignorant. And um, having only what I need for the first scene and going in 
with what that is so that I can experience whatever's happening. And, you know, in a scene break, then go, what is the knowledge that I have just gained? And then how I enter the next scene. So how I prepare is to just face a situation the way you come into a classroom, the way you come into a stream yard <laughs> um, is, oh, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm coming to into this afresh unless the character comes in with a very clear agenda and I want to make sure that that's where I begin. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to prepare for the end of the play because literally my character doesn't know the end of the play. And it's one of the things that um, I had a wonderful director and a wonderful production. We did a wonderful production of Romeo and Juliet, which is, you know, the characters don't know the end of the play. You're starting out, we're getting ready for a party at the Capulet house. Let's start there. What a great place to begin. And a young couple meet and go from there. And then circumstances occur. But the best way to prepare is to come in the way you start the top of the play. Um, yeah, does that make sense or? It does. I, I I love that, and I I I as I'm looking at my notes, the next question I had was, was also just about another part of preparation, which is memorization. Mm -hmm. I want to acknowledge mm -hmm. the question I asked you from Eli. Also, Haley asked that question, but then I I don't. Th there were so many, um, just a number of of students who asked uh, uh, a question. How do you how do you memorize all those lines? What is what's your trick? Well, I would like to say. <laughs> that um, one of the joys of uh, aging is that memorization um, is quite honestly a much more difficult process. Um, when I was younger, I was able to read something a couple of times, rehearse it a couple of times with the script in hand, and then, oh, those lines were there, even with Shakespeare. But I mean, I had been reading the play as a preparation several, you know, dozens of times before I would uh, begin that um but i do i do a, a bunch of different things to memorize lines one is to keep reading read it read it again read it out loud read it again read it out loud um i also do things where i'm where i'm taping is that still a word that you use i'm recording however the uh, the term is right now and then listen to myself saying the yeah. lines and I try to say them in a monotone way so that I'm not acting them out and that it is just like this so that I don't get into a habit of all you're, you're trying you're trying to sound like that the first time yes if I record it so that I am not oh. so that I don't get stuck into hearing my own line reading that I want to have very when oh, I'm uh, with another character when I'm with another actor, then I can respond and I don't respond in my rote memorized uh, line reading, if that makes sense. It, it then, does now. Okay. <laughs> okay. And then I like to, um, I write out the script in my own hand and somehow reading um, the script in my own, uh, in my own handwriting uh, is a way for me to take ownership of it, take ownership of those words um, in a way that, oh, I see myself within the words that are being chosen and um, and why why the character needs to say those words. But it is so much repetition and it's so much more now that I'm 61 than it was when I was 22, it, which was like easy as pie. And now it's, it is very much um, labor. It's, it's part of the labor that is necessary to do the work. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, that's that's uh, I, 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 that's useful for me. Uh, others of you, I'm sure, out there who are actors, um, you know. And if you have follow up questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, there was one question we were. Um, I was just sort of uh, chatting with you a little beforehand, Sarah. Mm -hmm. How great all these questions were this time. And there was a question you said, "Oh, that sounds like that came from somebody who's an actor." So let me ask you that one next. Okay. Uh, this is what I isn't there, I mean, I'm thinking of categories: experience and emotions. So you, you, the ways that you experience plays and your, your emotional um, response to them. Uh, Grace asks, "Does your love for each play depend on the cast and people you work with?" I, I yes, so. <laughs> And even going back, and I think I've said this to you, Josh, is that part of, I think, the reason that I still admire Theseus has to do with the fact that I had a wee bit of a crush on the first Theseus that I worked with. 
So I'm sure that had a lot of <laughs> a lot of influence. Um, but yeah, it does. And there are um, the Romeo and Juliet that I spoke of, where we don't know the name. We you know the characters don't know the end of the play. Is it was a cast that was just. It was perfect. It was uh, Jim DeVita played um, uh, Romeo in that, who is an, uh, a longtime actor at APT. Um, and, and no offense to others, also one of my favorites at APT. I, I, I love to see him perform. Oh, he's a wonderful, wonderful actor. But that was the role that brought him to APT, was playing Romeo. Um, and, uh, and then Kate Davis was in it. And we just had a wonderful cast. And it just had a spirit of love and joy and... It was just, it's, it, it will always be a favorite play of mine, partly because that experience was such, such, yeah, it was such a joyous experience. Can I, can I find that on YouTube? Oh, I don't know. No. I, I, we really Are there don't. secret record recordings of that? No, I, man, I would love to see it. Can't be because of the union. Um, they're yeah, really, yeah. um, recordings at least. And I don't know how that will vary with, um, there may be, you know, because of uh, because we're not able to have theater. We uh, there may be some recordings out there, but they are, there haven't. There's not supposed to be. <laughs> no, well, this this is what's beautiful though about live theater, and and, and something that I think that um, you know students right now and, and other audience members can't participate in is, is that idea that you you know if you go to see the same movie your friend went to see on a different night. You see the same movie, your friend, you know, yeah. right? But yeah. maybe annoying people in the audience talking or something like that. But but it, but but the performance will be roughly the same, that, or, or will be the same. Whereas yeah. the live theater, it's just always different each time. So even if we had a recording of that that show, it wouldn't be of that show, it'd be one instance of that show. And and uh, this, this raises this other question um, that, that Robert asks, which is, does the audience factor into your thought process when you're preparing, and I'll add, we're performing a role, right, which makes the show different every time. Um, it's it's uh, it's an interesting thing when we're rehearsing a play, um, we're more concerned about one another and about the playwright and uh, getting things to be in a shape that gives us a basic shape as to how we would like to perform the text. But once the audience is then sort of the the third part of it. There's the the playwright, the cast, and then the audience that are sort of the three legged stool of of any uh, performance. They shape it completely. You can feel energy of a of an intake of breath or of laughter that that allows you to ride a wave or um, of different aspects of it. It's not so much during rehearsal as it is. Um, once we're really in performance and that's the excitement of finally having our first audiences come in has to do with how they do shape it because we're all in community and then we're all together breathing and, and being a part of the storytelling. I, I like that. Um, I think it, uh, another question that I, I want to hit here about experience and emotions, um, and I'm, I'm looking at the time, and you know, we'll we'll take we'll done another seven questions, seven of these questions that I'll focus on, and then as questions come in, uh, we'll make sure that we open to uh, to those viewers on YouTube Live. Um, so those on YouTube Live, you can, you can begin posting any questions you might want to ask, or if you just love these questions, I have so many wonderful questions from the students in the Y Shakespeare class. You can just sit back and enjoy the ride. My next question is from Jordan. How did it feel to speak out the famous speeches in public? For example, Unsex Me from Macbeth or The Quality of Mercy is Not Strained from The Merchant of Venice. And I, would, I love this question, an emphasis on feeling. How does it feel? Yeah. Um, it's funny, I was watching um, the television series Slings and Arrows. <laughs> Canadian uh, television program that is about um, a fictionalized version of the Stratford Festival. And there's one port part where an actor who is uh, now directing had played the part of, ha the director who had played the part of Hamlet is then directing uh, an actor now playing the part of Hamlet. And he said, you got seven speeches and then you get through this. And um, he talks about, okay, here's the biggie. And he said, how do you feel about to be or not to be? And he's like, well, it's, I am, 
I am taking on the history of every great actor who has ever said those words. And the fact is, that is a way to intimidate the heck out of yourself and to stop you from being able to do it. Yeah. It has to be, it's a strange thing. You have to treat it like, what is? what are the circumstances that tell me to say these lines right now? What is it that I am trying to figure out as I say this soliloquy to the audience that I'm sharing my inner thoughts, how does this fit within the play? What is it that I'm wanting from myself to figure out what this is? Um, and what am I trying to to get when I say the quality of the is not strained? It's like, it's a beautiful speech about what it is that justice and mercy are. And at the same time, you're saying it in order to convince Shylock that he needs to be just, one must have mercy. Mm -hmm. But it's, you're in an argument, you're stating your beliefs of, the, of this argument to why he needs to do this. Um, so it's, it, you, you have to be in the play in, I mean, you have to be in the circumstances of each moment. And, uh, and that can, that will save you if you, um, so that you don't get intimidated by every great actor has said these words and it's just so intimidating. And you make them yours because you're making it real to the Shylock that you're speaking to. Um, and with Unsex Me Here, you're obviously speaking to the gods or um, to, uh, yeah, that. I love it. Yes, we we will we will see later in this particular class. We'll we'll talk a bit about that uh, on sex be here line, and then we'll uh, others. You'll have to you have to go on your own for Merchant of Venice, but be happy to chat with you about it. Um, we have a few questions about characters and plays. Then I'm going to do a lightning round. That we're going to take uh, questions from YouTube. Uh, mm -hmm. Brayden asks, "What is your favorite play by Shakespeare, and why do you think it's still relevant today?" <sighs> Oh, I have some, I, my favorite play has always been Hamlet and I'm sure um, part of it does have to do with this great experience that I was afforded by being able to be in it and be in it a couple of times. I think it's, it's sort of, uh, I, I love the character of Hamlet because I think he's, I think he is every student who overthinks everything but wants to take action um, I think there is a sense of what justice is within it at the same time of, um, I don't know, I, I, I Hamlet, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Um, sometimes Hamlet's my favorite. Just not what's usually. Your favorite? What's your uh, favorite? Henry the Fourth, Part One. It's yeah. about, about like three hundred twenty-four days of the year. So you know, then <laughs> okay. there, then there are other days I'm just you know so taken by another one. Um, Let's see, uh, Colin asks, which role was the most difficult for you to embody? Oh. That's a good question. Yeah, it is, thank you for that question. Um, I really had trouble um, uh, with uh, playing Regan in um, King Lear. Huh. And I think part of it had to do with um, I think I was thinking in too caricaturish a manner, and uh, you know the two, the two evil sisters of Goneril and Regan are sometimes are are just difficult. And I I played Goneril, and I think uh, uh, quite a number of years later. But for some reason, playing Regan at first was a very difficult uh, process for me. Okay. <laughs> I was like, well, you, you're so nice too. It just seems like that would, you know. I know. I could never play somebody mean. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do a lightning round. Uh, or I'm going to uh, ask you a question and, and 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 try to make you give me a 15 second answer. Okay. Yes, right. So the no, I won't ask big relevance questions. But so, uh, Herr Chen asks, who is your favorite character in Shakespeare plays? Um, Hamlet. Okay, all right. Uh, Shreya asks, what is your opinion on movie adaptations of theater plays? I am, um, I'm not a big fan because I think a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, 
plays were written to be experienced communally. And I, I am always going to be, I am for plays. I think movies are great to get a story out, but I think as far as an experience, a play will always top that for me. Was okay. that 50 okay. I think it was, I think it was. Um, one of the students asked, this was last semester, but I have this question. Uh, if you could pick a Shakespearean character to be your Uber or Lyft driver, uh, or your or your green or your green cab driver. Who who would you pick? And I'm adding, who would you ins not get in the car with? Um, well, I think. Oh, I do remember this. There was the idea of I would love some good stories from Falstaff, but I would worry about the inebriation, right? <laughs> Don't drive. get the car with Falstaff. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but um, but I think I don't know the ones who can spin a really good story, and he does okay. that, and that makes me happy. Okay. And if you were late, to, if you're running late for a flight that you had to catch and you didn't Ooh. want a story. Oh, gosh. Uh, oh, who is efficient? Let me think. Uh, <laughs> oh, I, <laughs> Consistently efficient. They all kind of fail there. Yeah. Um, uh, oh, I can't come up with anybody. Oh, I, shot. I feel like, I mean, if it's a 15 minute ride, like, I, I think Lady Macbeth could do it in 10. <laughs> Cars on the side of the road. You're Good. making a flight. Um, yeah, we'll not fail, right? <laughs> courage to the gas pedal that's, and we'll that's not right. fail. That's right. Alyssa asks, what originally drove you to perform in Shakespeare's plays? In other words, why Shakespeare and not other history-rich plays? 15 seconds. <laughs> oh, I, I guess I got started doing them. And, and actually, a movie adaptation is the reason I did fall in love with, like, Romeo and Juliet. When I was a kid, I saw Franco Zeffirelli's Romeo and Juliet, which I still think is one of the most beautiful films. Um, okay. I saw that, and then I wound up doing high school Shakespeare. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. A few people had a question that kind of led me to this. Desert Island Shakespeare, you have three. And one, I'm going to say one of them can't be Hamlet. <laughs> Okay, because I do say that all the time. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to say As You Like It, which I find just so charming. Um, and uh, Henry 4-1. And um, I guess Lear. Okay. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it looks like we have a few questions coming in. Uh, so I'm going to post this one here. Put this one up here. Felicia asks, what do you look for the first time you read a play and how does that change or develop after the second, third or fourth time reading? Well, because I'm a vapid actor, um, I look for what are my lines, gosh darn it. And I, I sort of, <laughs> and the first time I read a play, I mean, not if I'm just reading a play, I'm trying to get an overarching story. What is the story that's going on? Then I guess, secondly, I then am sort of line counting in some sort of way. Where is it that I'm either talked about or where is it that the character I'm playing is speaking? Um, and then I'm trying to figure out how it is that I fit into to the world. Mm -hmm. um, that's always the most exciting is figuring out what it is that, how it is that I am of service to the play and to the story, the character that I'm uh, portraying. Okay. We may have time for two more. So I'm going to pop this one up here. This is uh, this is like this is Scott, one of our teaching team here um, at Amplifies Casey's question, which do you have any pre-show rituals that get you into character or calm your nerves? Uh, We're going to borrow these, as Scott points out, so that we can like amp ourselves up before we jump on Zoom. Yeah, a lot of it is breathing and focusing, and um, and figuring out where it is that I have just come from. Um, the thing that I said, uh, getting ready for a show. I do have usually a cup of coffee. I chat with my fellow actors. Um, and then it's, it's, a, it's breathing and focusing on where it is that I am just coming from. I need to remember to breathe a little bit more sometimes, I think. That's yeah. a good one. Um, I'm going to bring in... Really great. <laughs> so Rebecca Kempfer asked, what encouraged you to pursue a career in the arts despite the challenge of breaking into the field? So emphasis on that challenge part. Yeah. Um, and nowadays, uh, theater career is a very, uh, we, we have no idea when the next uh, time that is. I was incredibly lucky that my parents were supportive, quite honestly. Um, a lot of people don't have that, but who still have great careers. But I was... Uh, I really felt drawn to to the theater. Um, I was um, I was doing well and able to be hired at sort of a certain level. And then 
Um, I, I had encouragement um, and support uh, from, I had a good support base with my family and uh, I was incredibly fortunate. Well, I'm noticing, uh, despite uh, dozens of other questions I might ask you that we've hit time. And so uh, I will uh, I'll look forward to doing this again with you, but also um, I'll look forward to those who are joining on October 6th. We'll have the actor Bear Bellinger will be joining us and uh, from Chicago and we'll be uh, having a conversation with him. Um, and so uh, please join us again. We'll post information if you want more information on holding history or you want to read more about Sarah Day, there are some links below. Uh, and thank you so much, uh, Sarah Day. Let, please uh, join me in, in thanking Sarah for uh, taking the time to be with us today. Thank you, it was a pleasure.